From the land of lakes, this is 10,000 Takes. Brought to you by Minnesota Score Radio. Wally and Eric back for yet another week as we slice and dice the always busy, always topical, super <laughs> saturated Minnesota sports scene. And Wally, snow is on the ground and the holidays are here. And the Minnesota Vikings front and center are dominating the uh, sports pages and sports talk shows right now in the Twin Cities. Yeah, playoff football is in the air. Uh, they can clinch if they beat the Jets and some other things happen in the division this weekend. And um, that's a big if, but it'll be their first title since 2017. The Bears have won a title more recently than the Minnesota Vikings in the NFC North. So, yeah, I mean, good things have happened for them this year. They win another squeaker over New England. You were there on Turkey Day. I opted out. I decided to stay home and eat pumpkin pie and all that good stuff. You and really missed out. You got the free turkey meal fun. from I the... Uh... I'll tell you what, they stuffed us good. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was an entertaining game, like you yeah. said. Came down to the wire, another one of those tightrope victories for the Minnesota Vikings. And, you know, NBC's in town. And, you know, it's Sunday big Night Football is the highest rated primetime show in the U.S. Yeah. And it has been for over a decade. And on Thursday night, it garnered huge ratings. Right. As did all three games on Thanksgiving. Uh, you had Buffalo at Detroit, the New York Giants at Dallas, and then Patriots at Vikings. And, they, and it was great theater in each game. I mean, they went right down to the final seconds in most cases. So... Uh, the NFL sure has a knack for luring people in, don't they? Yeah, they do. And uh, I see that your Green Bay Packers continue to tumble. They Ooh. they got dumped by Philly. So, And I know Aaron Rodgers got hurt and Jordan Love came in. and But they lose what? What was it? Was it 43 to 30? 40 to 33. I believe that yeah, was 40, it. To, 40 30. to 33. I mean, you can't give up 40 points. You can blame Aaron Rodgers all you want. And, you know, the fact that Jordan Love came in and was somewhat successful. But you can't give up 40 points uh, and, and expect to win a football and, game. And, and, and that kind of football really disgusts me. <laughs> I've got to have some defense mixed in. I, I mean, are you kidding me? I watched part of that game. It was just back and forth, back and forth. It Nobody's like, stopping yeah, anybody. Yeah, it was like no. a video game. And my goodness, I don't need to see 73 combined points in a football game. I like some defense <laughs> sprinkled in. Yeah. Well, the Vikings took apart a very good New England defense, I thought. Um, I mean, you know, they didn't dismantle them, but they moved the ball up and down the field for the most part. Got some clutch plays, got some Clutch throws from your guy Kirk Cousins again. Uh, I don't know. I think that they have a reasonable chance in the NFC to make a, a run in the postseason. They're going to get – if they stay on this path, even if they aren't the number one seed, say they're the number two seed, you're, if they're the two seed, they're going to get two home games, right? If, if they win, win the, the first, first one, yeah. of course. Well, that's <laughs> There's a, a big, caveat. That's a big F. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, until they get to the NFC championship game – and they still could be a home team there, depending on who they would play. But if they were to win, they could host all the way through potentially, even at the number two seed. So yeah, and if Philadelphia were to stumble, that's what I mean. Suddenly, you could have an NFC right. title game in Minneapolis. I, yeah, I think. Look, Minnesota Vikings have had a great season. To be able to uh, wrap this thing up, you know, this early between Thanksgiving and the first of December is rather remarkable when you think about it. So let me ask you this though. All right, they win. Let's say they win the NFC North with say 13 wins, for example. Okay, which I think is about right. Uh, they get the number two seed, and they lose early. Is this season successful that you just said? No. Okay. Well, I, I mean, the regular season would be. Yeah. But for the Minnesota Vikings, the backdrop is always, hey, they don't have the Lombardi. <laughs> They've never taken the confetti shower. For this franchise, it's about winning a title. I realize Kevin O'Connell, Quasi Adolfo Mensa, the newbies in town, they don't have anything to do with the previous 61 years, but they are linked in that chain now. Of course. And the, the group that can deliver that title to Minnesota, if and when it ever happens, <laughs> will never pay for another meal again. <laughs> they will be considered royalty for life. But, yeah, you, you can't have a splashy season like this and then, you know, go out quickly. Was it a success for the L.A. Dodgers, my team? No. Was it a success for your Ohio State Buckeyes? No. No, not at all. I mean, that's, you have to set the bar at championship or bust. Yeah. And right now, um, they're on the path. But, you know, defense is still a concern. 
And, and I think that you have to keep that in mind. I mean, this is a defense that's been giving up bundles of yards, and they still manage to win football games. And uh, will it come back to haunt them becomes the next question. It, it could, and I want to give credit to teams that are resilient and have that knack for winning close games, which the Vikings have had. But they've also had a lot of things bounce their way. In the game against New England, the Patriots had a roughing the punter penalty that extended the drive that right. eventually became the winning touchdown for Minnesota. And the Hunter Henry call, I still can't believe it. That was a touchdown. Oh, and yeah. they took four points away from New England because they settled for the three. But that was a ridiculous uh, overturn of, of everybody in the building, I'm sure, said touchdown. No, Even I though the Viking fans were elated, I, I just I am so sick of the NFL micro-analyzing these catches and telling us that what we saw isn't actually what we saw. Yeah, and to review, the play was a catch was right, a right near the goal line. And as the as Henry went down, it looked like the ball might have moved as he went towards the ground. But man, I watched that replay about a half dozen times. I thought that well, that's a touchdown. There's there's no debate here. And when they signaled incomplete, I thought, wow, they're really well, they must have an angle we didn't under see. the ball and the ball he hit the ground hard. It didn't pop up. I mean, and the review took what 20 minutes. I went back for a third helping of food. I mean, it was <laughs> well, it was like another intermission. That's with or without yeah, the uh, long review. You're back. <laughs> I never met a meal I didn't like. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow, you're beating me to all these punchlines. You don't leave me much to go no. with here. <laughs> all right, so the Jets are in town this weekend. Um, what do you like about uh, what they're facing? Because they saw Mike White played for the first time last week and was very good for the Jets in their win. Um, Zach Wilson is no longer the starting quarterback. I think that they still want him to be their future starting quarterback, but right now it's Mike White. Yeah, Zach Wilson was persona non grata last week against Chicago. He's in the doghouse. He's going to have to grow up, and Robert Sala is the head coach. He was with San Francisco as their defensive coordinator a few years ago. Look, they're an improved football team, right? and they are battling for a playoff spot, not just a wild card spot. They could win the division. They could win the division. Yeah. So this is a key game for the New York Jets. They only come to Minneapolis once every eight years. So it'll it'll be, you know, Gang Green's going to show up. And just like New England last week, there were a lot of Patriot fans wandering around downtown Minneapolis when I went into the House of Noise. I'm guessing we'll see some... Jets fans as well coming in. You're going to see some Joe Namath jerseys, I'm guessing. I love the old school I stuff. Know. Yeah, Joe Namath. Emerson and, Boozer. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Don <laughs> Maynard. Richard Todd. Richard Todd. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Lewis Eisen. That's right. It's a TV star. Now. now it's Mike White. Now it's Mike White. All right. Well, we'll find out how Mike White and company does against the Vikings on Sunday at uh, U.S. Bank Stadium. It's a new one, right? It is. You don't have to get up early. Are you going? No. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. Minnesota maybe. Vikings on the roll of rolls, <laughs> and he's going to stay home. <laughs> I might be out of town. We'll see. All right. Yeah. A lot more coming up. This is 10K Takes, your New York Jets ticket. I've been meaning to give you these for many years. I think they're It isn't just about vision, it's about care. Nobody cares for eyes more than Pearl. Ten thousand takes continues along, and uh, the world sport is what we're talking now. Yeah, yeah soccer on the front burner we're on the world global. stage. <laughs> yes, very global. It's World Cup time, and the United States has advanced into the knockout round. And joining us now, Manny Lagos, sporting director for Min U. Manny, uh, a lot of smiles across American faces when it comes to soccer with a big win over Iran. Yeah, it was, it was a huge day. Obviously, um, you know, we, we had a first game against Wales where we played really well. We ended up tying, so there was a little sour taste in our mouth. England with a must-result game where we had to make sure we, we walked off with either one point or three. Outplayed England, you know, one of the favorites in the tournament. Um, ended up tying them, and so today was a do-or-die. It was essentially a final, and uh, I, I just thought the, the team played so well. I think they embraced. It's a really young squad. I think they just embraced that we're, we're so eager to show the world that we're getting better at soccer, we're getting better, we're, 
we're getting more and more people involved. The stadiums are full here for our league, for MLS. So for the guys to step on the field um, against a Iran, Iranian team that really packed it in defensively, they really made sure it was going to be a tough day. All they had to do was tie. Uh, to get the result was huge. Tell us about Kristen uh, Pulisic. He plays for Chelsea in the EPL. A U.S. kid, though, who's really blowing up as a soccer star. But he gets hurt in the game against Iran. Uh, how good is he? And do you think he'll be ready for the Netherlands on Saturday? Well, let's hope he is. I mean, he, he's a key part of our team, especially offensively. I, I think one of the cool things about Kristen Pulisic, <laughs> Tyler Adams is our captain. He's a kid from New York. Kristen's from Hershey, Pennsylvania. They went over to Europe at young ages. Um, Kristen especially. Started at Dortmund and then got bought by Chelsea for $65 million. He's obviously one of our, our big stars now in, in this young group of World Cup players. Tyler Adams, our captain, has been just an amazing leader. He started at the Red Bulls in New York and MLS and then you know got sold and played over in Germany now. And and again, I, I just look at this group of, of young players who are, I think, exceeding expectations for this World Cup. The idea really is for us to kind of use this World Cup for when we host in 2026. All these guys will be in their prime in four years. And for them to come out, have three outstanding games, have games that I think really get the country excited. And now they'll get excited for the World Cup because it's the knockout stage that anything can happen. So uh, we have Netherlands up next, up, up, up next. But today, what a fun day. I mean, bars were packed. Everybody, the eyes were on it. And, and this young, awesome team came through. All right. You talked about what this could mean for the U.S. World Cup in 2026 when the United States hosts. But what does this mean for below that youth soccer and some of these uh leagues that feeder leagues into mls and into the european leagues what does it mean for american soccer uh long term do you think well again i mean obviously the sport is growing and growing and we, we had our big watch party it was packed today at allianz field it was amazing to have the snow in the background of our brew hall where it was just u.s soccer fans and the first two games we had outside cd we had it up on the big screen it was packed and and for me that's an signifies we're putting a ton of money into the sport. We're putting a ton of money into our youth development, our academy, all the youth clubs here. We want all those kids dreaming and wanting to be in soccer here. So for us, it's a huge time for us to really develop these young players, like future stars. And one way to do that is for them to dream. And combined with the dream now, they have a path to becoming pro soccer players. They have a path to becoming big time players. And ultimately, all the win today is measured. And yes, it's probably worth hundreds of millions of dollars for the sport itself in this country in terms of investment, development, et cetera. But it's also so important because we have so many young kids involved now in that path to becoming, hopefully, future U.S. national team players, future hopefully global stars. And for this team to do well, it's part of the sport is dreaming about it. Is the uh, U.S. team, Manny, uh, a four-wheel drive soccer club in the sense that you go back to February that frigid game at Allianz Field against, I believe it was Honduras. They win that, and now they're over there in Qatar or Qatar, as some people call it, in, in extreme heat on some occasions. So they're winning in a lot of different ways, aren't they? <laughs> they, they are. I love that you just brought up the connection to, of Minnesota as being part of the reason for us in the World Cup. That was a, a pivotal moment in our qualifying games. To get that win, it was, it was wonderful necessary for us to get that win to qualify. Uh, in that frigid cold day, it was a great day in Minnesota. Again, I was just at Allianz earlier today with everybody. I, I was chatting about that with a ton of the media today. Uh, what a special moment. And then today, again, for, for the fans who showed up, the Minnesota fans all over the state and the bars where they were, and obviously our fans that came out to Allianz Field, uh, just to have that connection of that day and special moment. And then now, just the support that, that this country has for this young team, that you know, who knows what can happen. You know, Again, I, I think they're very confident against this Netherlands team on Saturday. I think we believe, you know, certainly we're not a favorite at all for the rest of the tournament. But ultimately, um, you know, I think there was a lot of skeptics we'd get out of this group. And I love how this team proved them wrong and kind of showed that where American soccer is. We're not at the top echelon yet, but we're growing. We're getting there. Um, elephant in the room. You can't go beyond uh, this without talking about the political end of it with the Iranians um, upset, protesting. They wanted the U.S. thrown out. Uh, because of the protest over the flag and, and, and so on and so forth. Let me ask you this. Do you think that this had infiltrated into the team at all? Well, again, I, I think you got a great coach in Greg Berhalter. He's a great leader. Um, I actually, luckily, to get to know him, contact him a little bit. Obviously, he's somebody that I think makes sure these guys stay focused and are on point. And, you know, for me, you know, when the media pushes this stuff, and it is, this is when we played Iran back in 1998, they called it the most politically charged game in the history of the World Cup. 
today kind of had certain elements of that too, feeling where we, we, we don't always get along on the political side. But what I love about today and what I love about the World Cup and I love that the global game unites everybody. At the end of the day, there was two, 22 players on the field battling and fighting to win something, but they were all had one thing in common. And that was soccer. And that was that this event is about bringing out the best in the global side of things. It's about unifying and reminding ourselves what we have in common. And ultimately for me, I, I, this is why I love the World Cup. You know, play against countries who, you know, you don't always agree with politically, but at the end of the day, sometimes soccer can help bridge that, help sometimes we can remind ourselves that there's more than just politics to, to the world and life. And again, uh, for me, I thought our young group really put all that stuff aside, We're really focused. I mean, the way the game went, we had to come out on the front foot, we had to attack, we had to get going, and we really didn't let them breathe. We, we The whole first 45 minutes, we were all on top of them, probably could have had a couple more goals, but they didn't have a chance, so I only got a shot on goal the entire first half. Team Canada had high hopes, didn't go the way the Canadians wanted. But from the menu perspective, uh, Dane St. Clair, your goalie, MVP in the MLS All-Star Game back in August in St. Paul, he's getting World Cup experience. What will that do for his game? Yeah, great point. I mean, I, I, I was really gutted for Canada. I, I thought they, they finished top of the qualifying group. They had a great run. Uh, they hadn't been in the World Cup for 36 years, and I think there was a lot of hope that they would – Get out of the group. Also, win. they've never won a game in the World Cup, so unfortunately, they, they, they continue that. Hopefully, this third game now, uh, it's more than likely that Dane will get the start, and, and they're probably going to play some young guys to get experience, hopefully, for their next round in 2026, which they automatically qualify for as well because they're hosting a couple games along with Mexico. We're, we're hosting the bulk of them. And certainly for Dane, it's going to be a great experience. I mean, the, 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 the ability to step on the field for your country, the ability to hopefully get their first ever win in the World Cup, and then certainly to be part of that, to, to build into four years from now, uh, couldn't be happier for him. Again, not set set, but it's almost for sure that he'll get the game coming up here. All right, Manny, appreciate you spending some time with us. Uh, hopefully the U.S. can keep it going. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Yeah, big one on Saturday. Uh, looking forward to it. And again, it's, it's been an amazing experience. Like I said, I couldn't be happy for, for the group team, for the fans of U.S. soccer. And again, uh, that staff uh, and the players out over there did such a great job in, the, in this state, group stage. Uh, and let's keep it up. All right. Thank he you. is Manny Lagos, sporting director for Minnesota United. And USA is headed to the knockout round. Back with more here after this timeout. Stay with us. I've been meaning to give you these for many years. I think they're perfect. <laughs> It isn't just about vision, it's about care. Nobody cares for eyes more than Pearl. Ten thousand takes rolls along, and so do your Golden Gophers. How about that? Uh, a big win in Madison, Wisconsin against Bucky Badger. They keep the axe for the second year in a row. That hasn't happened for a while. Jim Wacker was the head coach <laughs> the last time that the Gophers won it twice in a row. So, um, I guess you're on an upswing, but I mean, there are a lot of little things that I think you have to examine when you look at this season. And I think that the biggest thing is, you know, they played one of the weakest schedules in all of Division I football. I saw the number. I think they were like third from the bottom <laughs> as far as strength of schedule yeah, in yeah. all of D1 football. So if you figure that in, okay, so they were eight and four, right? You figure that into the equation, it's like, okay, you should be at least eight and four, if not better. You probably should have been 10 and two. I, I, I agree. I, I don't want to throw darts at a team that did beat their arch rival, Wisconsin. Right. They do finish on an up note. They'll go to a better bowl game thanks to that win in Madison last week. But it's a woulda, coulda, shoulda season. If there was ever a time for Minnesota to rise up and win the Big Ten West, which the Gophers have never, ever done yep. in their history, you have Iowa. You know, not a great Iowa team. They squandered their chance oh by boy. losing at home to Nebraska. How do they come to Minneapolis and win and they lose at home to yeah, Nebraska? Go figure. P.J. called it the wild, wild west after the game Saturday in Madison. He pointed out Iowa and Illinois, which for a long time was trending up. And then Wisconsin and Minnesota. And Purdue winds up winning it almost by default. But <laughs> this, this is 
such a mediocre division for Minnesota to not pounce on the opportunity. That's my takeaway. Yeah. Now, it was a good win over Wisconsin, but it may bite them in the butt long run because – I think that's why the Badgers went out and got Luke Fickle from Cincinnati. I think they really wanted Jim Leonard. But when they had that last possession on offense against oh the Gophers with the hold and three false starts, they got down to the Minnesota five. You know, touchdown and an extra point ties it. Touchdown and a deuce wins it. Yeah, 25 yards later going backwards. Unbelievable, <laughs> chaotic disorganization yeah. for Wisconsin. I think the powers that be then said, you know what? We better go get a better coach. And they got Luke Fickle, and he may come into Minnesota next year, and it might be a whole different story. He's a good coach. Yeah, he's had a lot of success at Cincinnati. He sure has. And I think that his name has been at the top of the list for co uh, for uh, organizations for uh, the last couple of years. Now, this is nothing new. He's got Big Ten ties at your Ohio State University, was excellent at Cincinnati. I think he's been waiting for the right opportunity, and he knows the Big Ten. So this will make the Big Ten even more competitive. And then you've got USC and UCLA jumping into the party in 2024. All right, so what is your take <laughs> on uh, Camp Randall State? Oh, boy. Uh, you and I were both there for the Gopher game against Wisconsin. Uh, we eventually found our way to the press box. It was, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a rat's maze. I mean, it's unbelievable. Uh, but we got there, and then we went out and sat in the stands. You, both of us went out at, at halftime and, and found spots in the stands to sit. I sat up on the second level, and they do that jump around thing after the third quarter. And um, I got to tell you, man, I'm a little concerned. I mean, I looked at the physiques and the diets of the folks in Wisconsin over there, and to jump around, that whole second deck, I mean, I felt like I was on an ocean liner. It was going like this, and holy Toledo. I'm not sure I want to be where I am right now. Well, beer brats and cheese doesn't usually lend itself to a, to a svelte physique, but the, the vibe and electricity at Camp Randall is incredible. It is great. It's off the I chain. Agree. Now, that stadium's got old bones. It's <laughs> been around for a while, and I'm like, you know, I, I experienced what you did. You're walking around. There's not signs telling you where to go. You can get lost easy. The corridors are really yeah, narrow, it's, too. It's tight. The, I mean, yeah, they're like county roads. Oh, my you know? I goodness. I mean, there's not much room to maneuver. It's like a one-lane bridge. <laughs> but the fan base. I mean, remember, this was not a real good Wisconsin team. They right. finished with just six wins. But it seats almost 80,000. And if you looked, you know, into the student section, which was to my left where I was, it filled up almost to capacity. And, boy, they are engaged. And yes. then the jump around thing, yeah, the students are going bananas. But so are the old folks, too. It, the, as if on cue, it's That's a choreographed Wisconsin right. tradition. That's I was worried. They play <laughs> Buttercup Baby and everybody gets into it. So I was really impressed with you know, how much fun these folks have. It's a lot like going to Lambeau. I mean, it's Wisconsin. They yeah. live to party. All right. One other note on that jump around thing. So we're up on the second deck. Uh, Paul was with me. And they're doing the jump around between the third and fourth quarter. And the, like, like I said, the stands are waving. And then they, they're back to football. And I look over to my right. <laughs> and the aisles are filled. People are leaving. They're there for just to do the jump around. I think they're trying to collapse this stadium. I, I really believe that. They wanted to, they want to be part of history. <laughs> the whole thing goes crumbling so, to the so ground. So you were up top. I was. I was below. If that thing came uh, crashing down, I would have gotten pancaked, and who knows what would have happened to you. <laughs> exactly. Well, if I would have fallen some of those Wisconsinites, I might have been all right. <laughs> yeah, the scene in Madison. It's called Madtown for a reason. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> unbelievable. And walking to the game from our parking spot, uh, from the from the lot, boy, I tell you, you're going through a lot of different uh, parties and tailgate sessions and holy There's Toledo. a few bars along the way. Uh, Can you believe that? But here's the kicker to the whole thing, and we got to take a break. They do not serve beer inside that stadium, believe it or not. So it's a lot like Qatar, <laughs> the World Cup. And it's a good thing they don't because there were 50 people that were detained in that game. Most of them UW students. Arrested, in other yeah, words. Yeah, they got matching bracelets and were hauled away. Oh, boy. <laughs> All right. So there you go. All right. We need to take a break. Takes of the day coming up next. Stay with us. I've been meaning to give you these for many years. I think they're perfect. Maya? Oh, I love your 
Erin, why didn't you try these? It isn't just about vision, it's about care. Nobody cares for eyes more than Pearl. Ten K takes on television. Thanks for tuning us in in the Twin Cities, the Twin Ports, the Iron Range. Takes of the day coming up. But before we uh, wrap up this episode of Ten K takes on TV, we should talk a little Timberwolves. They're back in a funk. Oh boy, going down uh, the mountain the wrong way, and yeah. they lose their uh, their superstar cat. Yeah, Carl Anthony Towns out for indefinitely is what they're saying right now. Uh, a calf strain, you know, that could take weeks, could take a couple months. You know, it depends on how severe it was. But he's out, um, and as you said, prior to him uh, being out of the lineup, they lost three in a row. And, you know, this was on the heels of a five-game winning streak. So you try to balance this thing out. Where are they right now as a team? Have they got it figured out or don't they? I don't think they do. They're basically uh, an average to subpar NBA team at this point in the schedule. Now, there's a lot of games left. They still might get this thing right. right. But you take Cat out of the equation, oh boy. then what? Now more falls onto the shoulders of Rudy Gobert, and I think there already was a, a lot for him to try to process. With, with that kind of a trade where you give up a boatload of picks and players, there's no doubt Rudy has to be thinking, wow, a lot's expected of me. I'm the man in Minnesota, and so far it hasn't gone the way the T-Wolves won. I don't like the trade. I'll be honest with you. It's way too much to give up for just about anybody unless that person is Giannis, the Greek freak, or Steph Curry, or somebody like that. Yeah. Devin Booker, maybe? Yeah. Even LeBron. <laughs> I wouldn't give that much up for LeBron right now. Yeah. No well, way. I, I would take him over Rudy Gobert, though. I still wouldn't give that much for him. Mm. How many years are you going to get out of him? I don't know. Better than Rudy Gobert. All right, we got to do takes. <laughs> All right, uh, yeah, takes of the day. Are you a cranky Yankee, angry American? Maybe you're a happy camper. What is it? Well, as you know, we talked extensively about your Golden Gophers, uh, the football team, earlier in the show. And P.J. Flex team going into Madison and beating Bucky Badger for the second straight year, bringing home the axe. So Paul Bunyan's axe will be here in Minnesota for a while. Um, but after the game, and you and I were there, you went into the press conference afterwards, P.J.'s going on and on about how he was – People wanted him fired the week before after they lost to Iowa. Who said that? Nobody was saying that. Was he reading Twitter? Was he reading the comments in the Star Tribune online? What's going on, PJ? Nobody with any credibility was saying that you should be fired. Well, maybe if you say stupid things like that, maybe you should be fired. No, not really. I think he's done. You know, he's done a good enough job. He just needs to win more. You just need to. But I don't think he should be fired. No, and be happy, PJ. By the way, Mood Meter says you're a, a demanding diva. Okay. Be happy, PJ, that you've got some anger in that fan base as opposed to apathy. Exactly. At least they care. Exactly. <laughs> All right, well, my uh, take of the day, I'm going to talk about the Mount Rushmore of NFL quarterbacks who have had uh, really bad years they've cratered. Let's start with Matthew Stafford, Super Bowl champion, L.A. Rams. Concussion, he's out, and the Rams are going nowhere fast. No. Wow, I hope they enjoy the Lombardi trophy. <laughs> and then you take a look at Tampa Bay. Tom Brady, seven rings. Yeah, I know the Bucs are on top in the very mediocre NFC South with a 5-6 and six record, but Brady and the Bucs are a below-average NFL team at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Russell Wilson. He's got a Super Bowl ring and really should have had two if they've given the ball to beast mode back in the day. Denver thought they might get to the Super Bowl with Russell. That's not happening. It's no. been a huge and colossal disappointment at the elevation 5280. And finally... Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> he's got a Super Bowl ring. I don't think he's getting a second one. Not Green this year. Bay is uh, going south. Yeah, no question. And on that note, let's uh, FedEx out our thank yous. One to David Weld and the great crew behind the scenes. Also to Manny Lagos and Rocky. For Wally, I'm Eric saying so long. This is 10K Takes, your sports ticket.